All right, so to like set the stage, to review a little bit, we already know that in Java, every value has a type. And that type is either a reference to an object, like a reference to a turtle, a string, a vending machine, or it's one of eight primitives. Um, actually, we don't know that there are eight primitives yet, but we do now. Um, instead, so we've been focused on Boolean, int, double. Um, we're going to actually see that there's a total of eight primitives in Java. Um, and so we'll, we'll at least see what those are and how they compare to each other. Um, one thing I guess I just wanted to emphasize, we've certainly been doing this and we've been frustrated by this at times, but Java is a strongly typed programming language, meaning every variable and every value is of a specific type. This is why the first time we use a local variable and we declare it, we have to specify the type of the local variable. When we're specifying our parameter variables, when we're defining methods, we have to specify the types of the parameters. Right? That's because Java is strongly typed. We can't change from an int to a turtle to a string. Um, whatever type we declare it as is the type it has. So here are actually all eight of the Java primitive data types. For the AP Java subset, that is the subset of the Java programming language that you're expected to know for the AP exam, it's just the Boolean, int, and double. That's it. In this class, we do a little bit with char as well, which represents a single character because it's really useful sometimes. Um, and we do a little bit with long because we're going to see there's some limitations of the int type. What I've spelled out here um, is just to kind of show like what's the difference between these. So like Boolean kind of stands by itself. It's true or it's false. That's easy. Char is unique because it represents a single character, like one letter, one number, one symbol. Um, the way that that is stored is through a standard method called Unicode. Um, and so all, Unicode is not a Java thing. It's a worldwide standard. Um, and it uses 16 bits to represent a character. What I mean by a bit is a zero or a one. So things like binary representation. So a Unicode character is made up of 16 zeros or ones, which lets us represent a lot of different characters, um, like 64,000 different characters. Okay, So that's, that's pretty good. Um, byte, short, int, and long are all different integer types. They're all what are called signed integers, meaning they can represent both positive integers and negative integers. The difference between the byte, the short, the int, and the long is simply how many bits are used to represent that number. The reason why we care about that is it tells us the range of values that can be represented. So for example, a byte, which is eight bits, can only re represent integers from negative 128 to positive 127. Okay. Um, if we need a wider range than that, then we shouldn't use a byte, right? In reality, we just use an int for everything. Um, but if in some cases, we'll, we'll need to use a long. And we're going to explore that in more detail in a minute. So that's the difference between the integer types. In Java, there are two floating point types, a float and a double. Honestly, we just always use a double. Modern processors, modern operating systems are optimized for 8-byte floating point map. There's really not an advantage in most cases to using a float, so we just use a double. Um, a double covers a wide range of real numbers. You can see those are huge exponents there. Um, but still, there's only 8 bytes. There are 64 bits where we can't represent an infinite number of real numbers. Um, so we're somewhat limited on precision. How Java uses those 64 bits to represent a double is not Java specific. That's an IEEE standard. Um, that's done the same way in different programming languages, different processors, things like that. Um, if you're interested in that, you can always look at the Wikipedia page for like the IEEE floating point standard. Um, and you can see how the different bits are used for, for the base and for the exponent and stuff like that. So I want you to be aware that these exist. 
But as I said, in reality, we're going to just use booleans and ints and doubles. And sometimes maybe a char or a lock. So what I think is more important than these details is understanding the limitations of these different types. So we're going to do an example together. Um, so in BlueJ, in your BlueJ project window here, if you go to the view menu, you can choose show code pad. Or you can hit control E or command E on the Mac. And it's going to open up a new little window in the lower right, or a new little pane, I guess, in the lower right here. Um, the code pad is like a Python console. For those of you familiar with the Python console, we can type individual Java commands, and they're like immediately executed as if they were part of a Java program. So that's kind of cool. Um, so let's try one together. Oh, I got ahead of myself. I am sorry. With our primitive types, we'll come back to that in a minute. My apologies. Um, with our primitive types, or what are called primitive literals, when we assign literal values, like to a variable, um, these are how they're interpreted by Java. So if we use the keywords true or false, Java knows that's a Boolean. Um, so it knows the type of that value is a Boolean. If we put anything in single quotes, like the letter A, or this is a Unicode, um, a Unicode representation, I think this converts to the smiley face character. Um, anything in single quotes, Java will interpret as a character. Number Digits, like numbers, that's going to be an int, unless there is a decimal point, or it's in scientific notation, in which case it will be interpreted as a double. So we call these primitive literals because, like, if I say x equals 7, I am literally setting x to 7. Like, 7 is literally the value 7. It's not a variable. It's a literal value. So that helps me remember, like, what literal means. So these are examples of our primitive literals. All right, here's what I want to try. So I'm going to freeze this on one screen. And then we're going to type this code together into BlueJ on the other screen. So we can type in this, this bottom part of this new code pad here. I can type int n equals 1 million. So 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six zeros after the 1. And then I can do system that out dot println n times n. So I'm printing the product of a million times a million. And while I'm not exactly sure, okay, I am sure, um, what a million times a million is, I know it's not negative 72737996. Okay? That is not the correct answer. Um, but that is what is printed to the terminal. You'll notice I didn't get an error. I didn't get an exception. I just got a number that I know is wrong. And being aware that this can happen is actually the important thing for you to take away from the point. Not so much like there's these eight primitive types and they have this many bits, but more we just have to be aware um, that for certain calculations, we can get the wrong value and we need to know why that happens and how we avoid that. What this is called is called an overflow. Okay. When the computer processor does these mathematical operations, if, and we're dealing like with integers like we are here, if it, if it needs more than 32 bits to represent the number, it doesn't have more than 32 bits. It can't change it. So it just gets rid of the bits that it doesn't have. And so what that means is as the number gets bigger and bigger, Eventually, it overflows, meaning it goes from a really big positive number. We add one to it, and now we're at a really big negative number. That's the overflow. Um, old cars had like mechanical odometers that kept track of mileage. And if you drove the car far enough, eventually you get to the point where the, the whole the, the odometer would be like nine, 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 nine. And you drove that last mile. And it rolled over to zero. New car, yay. 
um, that's like an example of a mechanical overflow. Um, there are several examples of this, like in like uh, sometimes this shows up in web apps or computer games where you get to a certain level. Do you have an example? No. Oh. You get to like a certain level, and all of a sudden you go from level 255 to like level zero. Like what happened there? Um, or you're accumulating a whole bunch of points, and all of a sudden they all go negative. Um, another more serious example of this is the way we keep track of dates and time on computers. Um, the Unix epoch, like the start of time on, on a Unix computer, which is pretty much all the computers we've got, is uh, January 1st, 1970, I believe. Um, and we're counting seconds since then. We're getting close to overflowing the count of seconds, right? So we need to like update software and operating systems and things, and this has been going on for a long time, um, so that we don't all of a sudden turn on our computer someday and it's like back to 1970. Um, that would be a huge problem. So um, what we observed here is what's called an overflow. So with 32 bits, this is the range of numbers that we can represent. Basically negative 2 billion or so to positive 2 billion or so. A million times a million is bigger than 2 billion, and so we got the overflow. What you need to be aware of is that if there's the possibility of an overflow occurring, well, you got to pick a better type. Okay? So if we're dealing with really large integer values, we shouldn't use an int, we should use a long. Okay? Um, so it's just one of those design decisions you need to make. This XKCD comic here, um, the, the guy's counting sheep, like in his dreams, and he, he's counting a lot of sheep, and he gets to 32,767, and then the very next sheep that jumps over the fence is negative 32,768. Um, that's an, an example of an overflow if you have 16 bits, um, like if it was a short. You have 16 bits to represent the number, um, that's where the overflow would occur. So that's why that's fun. I do not expect you to memorize the maximum and minimum values for integers. We have much better things to do with our brains. There are constants defined. These constants are on your AP quick reference sheet. Um, there are constants associated with the capital I integer class. So you can do integer.min value or integer.max value if you need to use these in your code. This is like math.py or color.red type of thing. So. Just be aware that those exist. You don't need to memorize them. They're on the quick reference sheet. Let's try another value. So I'm going to freeze this on one screen. Oops, go back to the code pad. And we're going to declare a local variable of type double called f. I'm going to assign it a value of 4.35. And then I'm going to do system.out.println f or 100 times f. I can do this in my head. 4.35 times 100 is 435. However, when the processor does this floating point arithmetic, we don't end up with 435. We end up with something really, really close to 435, but not quite. We have 434.99999999. What we're observing here is that as mathematical operations are done, um, and they're done maybe not in ways, computer processors perform floating point arithmetic not the way we perform floating point arithmetic. It's a little bit different, a lot bit different. And so intermediate values, not every real number can be stored in 64 bits, right? So even though if we look back at our double here, even though a double has a huge range of values here, there is an infinite number of real numbers between these two values. And we can't represent an infinite number of real numbers. So we have a limited amount of precision, which is why these intermediate calculations, basically they, they get rounded a little bit. Um, and those rounding errors can result in a somewhat unexpected final answer 
Um, and so this again falls in the category of just something we need to be aware of. We can have rounding errors, okay? Because there's limited precision. Um, we use doubles because they have more precision than a float, but as we just saw, we can still have rounding errors. What do we do about this? We just need to be aware of it and we need to be careful when comparing double values. This is why when we wrote the mileage tracker test class, we didn't say like assert equals 100.0 comma um, amount, right? We didn't check if it was exactly 100. Because of rounding errors, it might be 99.9999994, right? So we specified that third argument, the epsilon value, where this is close enough to be considered equal. In our next unit, we'll learn how to write some code, um, like with an if statement, to compare floating point values and be like, hey, these are close enough to be considered equivalent. Right? For now, just be aware that this can happen and we shouldn't check if two doubles are exactly the same. Okay, we should always check if they're close enough. Related to that, in my experience, on the AP exam, they haven't expected you to write code to check if two values are close enough. Um, more just be aware of the concept, but we're certainly gonna learn how to write the code as well. All right, good place to pause.